Howdy, everybody. <laughs> what was that? So, so I don't. This is, hi, I'm Todd Conklin. Welcome to the Pre Action Net Podcast. I think that my Western roots just accidentally snuck out there. I don't really understand what the, how do you, I don't, that's not scripted. That, that wasn't in, that's not in the plan, but that's what you got. Hey, today's podcast is pretty interesting. I'm not going to talk very long at the beginning um, because, uh, well, first of all, I'm going to talk a lot during this. And secondly, it's a little long. So I thought I'd try to save a little time here. This is a really great podcast and you're really going to enjoy it. So a couple months ago or a month ago or so, I got an email from a, a person who's in a graduate program uh, for safety and they're studying new safety and safety two and Hall Nagel and safety differently and human, you know, all the stuff that we talk about all the time, high reliability. And they called me and they said, can, uh, can I do an interview of you for my research? And so I almost always try to say yes to that because why wouldn't you say yes? It seems dumb not to say yes. It's mean kind of plus you get to meet somebody new, so that's completely worth it for me. And usually the conversation is pretty interesting because they have a set of questions that they want to ask you and try to capture information by which they'll use that information then to either support their research question and write their thesis or dissertation, or in lots of cases, they'll formulate their research question based upon the research. So it's, it's good. I mean, it's, I did it when I got my degree, um, degrees, and, and other people, it's, it's kind of a trade-off. So, so that's what this is. So this guy who called me is, um, is pretty interesting. His name's Alan Turner, and he is currently – in, I think, Wilmington, North Carolina, which is a good place to be for those of you that listen to the podcast in Wilmington, because you're never far from a beach, and there's really pretty good food in Wilmington, just uh, between you and I. Anyway, he's at East, East Carolina University, and he's getting a degree in safety. Now, Alan spent about 30 years or so in Corning, and he worked with the optical fiber manufacturing dudes and dudettes, uh, not to be gender specific. And the last nine years of his career, or 10 years, I kind of going on what he told me, he was a safety and health lead for a really large manufacturing um, outfit. So he also has a background in the Navy where he worked in supply and logistics. So he's actually a really good fit for New View. And I think you'll see, because the conversation we have is a pretty, I thought it was good. I mean, you, you guys, you be the judge. You listen and, and sort of grade me. Did I answer his questions? Was I supportive and nice? Did I make the world a better place? Or did I, was I a poignant, snobby, ivory tower jerk? <clears throat> it's up to you. I mean, you'll have to decide that. W with no further ado, let's listen. I'll just jump right into the interview. This is Alan Turner on the Pre-Accident Podcast. So I'll start with the first question. How did you, um, and, and again, this is in the context of, you know, safety too, and, and uh, that's what I'm doing my thesis on. Um, how did you sell your leadership on the idea that safety too was a necessary process to improve safety? So that's the hardest part, I think. Um, the first rule in change management is to remember that you have to take the group from where they are to where they need to be. And so what we had to learn really early is that the initial, the initial push was towards the worker. And so they, they really wanted to do a lot of training for the worker. Let's get out some six tools for, you know, human <laughs> performance. Let's... Let's teach them the phonetic alphabet. Let's 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 you know fix these guys because if we fix them, that's <laughs> that's that makes it better. And right. and what we learned, and it, this was a really hard lesson. I had to learn it a bunch of times. Is that really the safety two change is not a change at the worker level. It's a change at the leadership level, and that what's really okay. shifting. And I wish I'd have known this twenty years ago. What's really shifting is how we view the worker. And so the okay. biggest thing we had to do with the workers or with the leaders is to help them understand that the traditional programs that they'd used so far, and it had been pretty successful for them so far. I mean, they got way better. Yeah. 
Those yeah. programs were pretty much all focused on fixing the problem worker. The worker was the problem, so let's fix the worker. So you saw lots of really behavioral focused, really individual right. interventions that were given to workers to make them safer. And we right. had to shift leaders to help them understand that what they needed to do was look at the worker differently. The worker isn't the problem. The worker's the problem solver. And right. so that challenge, and it's a challenge, that's the conversation you want to continually have with with leadership is to help them understand that the this part of the game, this next paradigm shift in reliable operations, the next paradigm shift is a leadership shift. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was, I, I enjoyed watching. I was on the ASSE weekly thing. There was that uh, nice little YouTube of you and um, Mr. Keller was it debating about behavioral based safety, and uh, um, I, I enjoyed the interchange there. I, 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 <laughs> myself, I, I've never been a fan of that. Um, the, the my, I, I'm retired from Corning uh, in North Carolina. And the plant I worked at, we also was was rep- the workforce was represented by the steel workers, and as you know, they 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 don't like that program. They call it the blame the worker program. But I so I sort of played off that, but I was glad I never had to kind of go down that path. I just saw the sustainability of this being so hard. But um, but, but you're right, you know, the, the 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 worker is not the problem. Right, but that that right. that shift for leaders, it's it's not hard. I, mean, I don't think it's hard. I don't think the shift's difficult. I just think we 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 make some assumptions that that leaders will already know that that when we start the conversation, they're at the same level of thinking that we are after we've read a bunch of books and thought about it and dealt with it. <laughs> so it really becomes not. important to sort of understand that you have to meet them where they are to get them to where they want to go, and and you want to be sort of strategically improvisational. So any anytime you have an opportunity to have a different conversation with a leader, post event, post near miss, post critical failure, that's a really good time to not only inform but also teach. Right. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, question two, which sort of leads in from the first question, as the as the professional in your organization, I mean, I guess it, it, um, this was at Los Alamos National Labs. Um, what did you do to get started implementing safety too? So that was probably a little easier story for us because okay. because we have a nuke facility, we we were really invited to participate in in safety too. So uh, oh, a guy okay. named a guy named John Sung, I'll never forget him. What a great guy! Um, okay. He came to my office one day and he said, "You know, there's this new way people are looking at safety, and you're really gonna like it." And of course, when he said that, I I nodded and agreed, like you do when you sit in your office. But the entire time, sure. I'm thinking, what could be new, and what am I going to like about it? Because I can't imagine anything new, and I can't imagine I'll like it. But they sent me to uh, a place called INPO, the Institute for Nuclear Power Operations, in Atlanta, Georgia, which was in some office building next to a big mall. I remember that, and okay. they introduced this new view of safety, safety differently, safety two. Um, they called it at the time human performance. Uh, this okay. guy named Tony Mashara, who's a great guy, someone you should talk to. Tony Mashara okay. uh, nodded his head inside a building, in a room where we are having this training, and sort of introduced this new view of safety, and that's kind of how it started. But to be really honest with you, I'm not sure I would have found safety too. Um, had it not been sort of thrust upon me, but but I'm kind of lucky. I mean, that, I think that's yeah. a, that was a lucky break for me. Moving on to question number three, then, um, do you feel that your upper management as well as your management peers are on board with safety too? Are they actively assisting you? So it ebbs and flows. So I always think of it this way: uh, if uh, if you're out riding a horse and thunder claps. The horse is going to buck you and run back to the barn. Um, and and so leaders are pretty good about talking new safety until something really bad happens. And then there's a real strong tendency to run back to the to what they know, to to sort of okay. what, what has served them in the past. And they'll buck you off and run back to the barn. But it's really iterative. You just you, you continually 
have conversations and you continually show improvement. But the problem we have, and this is true of all forms of safety, old or new, is we don't have a null set. So it's hard to it's hard to prove something that doesn't happen. So and okay. if we're really good at safety too, nothing happens. Right? I mean That's true. Right. And so we have right. this we have this really significant challenge of trying to prove that because we're using these new ideas, nothing's happening when in fact when they use the old ideas, mostly nothing happened too. So yeah. you have to be really ready for leaders to to fall back to the old way and you have to sort of give them space to respond emotionally to blame but they need to do it privately and they need to be able to recover from it what i tell leaders is they can think whatever they want to think but the way they respond to an event is a deliberate strategy and okay. they need to think about deliberately strategizing what they want out of that event yeah, I remember reading that in your book. You know, you had that that list of things to do when a when an incident occurs. Um, yeah, that that's I, I, I was I may I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but but just to go back to on one point you said about what you know what doesn't happen. Um, you know, in 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 your time in your line of work, I assume risk assessment and risk risk management is just huge uh, because of the nature of the things you do. Um, well, let me save that because I'm asking a question about that later on. We'll come back to that. So okay. That's that sort of a, but I've sort of got my interest peaked. Okay. So, um, question four: How are your employees empowered to have a voice in their day-to-day -day activities? Well, so one of the things that I think is really valuable, and this goes back a little bit to what we talked about earlier, is that employee empowerment. I actually prefer the word engagement, but I don't really know why, except I have a joke about it. That's why. Um, okay. <laughs> employee, employee empowerment. I'm really popular today. It's all these people yeah. trying to sell me crap. Uh, employee right. empowerment <laughs> is, is, so this is a little bit chicken and eggy. Uh, employee empowerment really, I think, is prepotent to how leadership sees employees. So if they see the employee as the problem, we have to fix these guys. These guys need to be more careful. If you know, if they took t if they followed the procedure, if they did what they're supposed to do, we wouldn't have this accident. It's really going to be hard to engage employees if the leader thinks the employee's the problem. Yeah. But if the leader thinks you know the employee's necessary to improvement and that the employee is going to actually solve the problem, then it's relatively easy to engage the employees, and okay. leadership supports it. So we're lucky. Um, we were lucky, and lots of companies I, I talk to now are lucky. You know, programs like VPP, um, say what you will about it, and there's lots to say about it, that's for sure. But the one thing it does yeah. is it really tries to shift the focus to engaging workers in problem identification and problem solving, and and that's, that's much different. But uh, the, there's a tendency to believe that – that leaders just need to engage their employees. And so what they do is sort of, I don't know, they, they cursorily include them in planning and then they give them money or rewards if they don't get hurt. That's not engagement. Yeah. And that's certainly not yeah. empowerment. That's just yeah. kind of sort of reinforcing the fact that if the workers were better, it, they'd be safer. Yeah, you're sweeping the problem under the rug because then they're just not going to say anything so they can get their incentives. And, yeah, for sure. Yeah, they'll just take themselves to the urgent care clinic after work instead of telling the nurse they cut themselves. And, um, okay, yeah, that that's interesting. Now, now so that, another question with that. So the leaders who believe employees are the problem, you know, is there is there any fix for them in your mind, or is it just that's just you got to get them to come around little by little? Well, sure, but I think that is the fix, right? That you have to you have to help them understand that that view is old. That's kind of a safety yeah. one view, and that yeah. there's a new, more enlightened way. And if you think about sort of, it's a pretty good bet that the the performance is on some kind of asymptote. You know, it's it started out high, it's gotten lower and lower and lower, and now they're really at some kind of number 
that they want to try to get beyond. They're hurting three people a year or whatever the number is, right? The only way right. they're going to break that asymptotic curve, because an, an asymptote is a, is a sign of a dying strategy, right? It means the current strategy yeah. is not sufficient to take you to the next level. And so right. the only way they're going to break that asymptote is to really bring in a new philosophy, a new paradigm. And so you just kind of yeah. keep having that conversation with them. The The thing that's really powerful is that once you have these sure. conversations with people, you can't really take it back. I mean, it's really hard right. to unlearn something. And so people generally, yeah. once, they, once they're enlightened, once they see kind of a new view, um, they tend to sort of move from there and go forward. Okay. So it's evangelization a day at a time, I guess, or a leader at a time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, moving on to question number five. What tools and processes do you provide to ensure your employees' success when they go out to perform their task? Huh. So there's lots of things. I mean, there's there's tons of stuff that we could talk about there. Um, it's it's uh, that's a really good question, actually. Um, <laughs> so 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 it. That question on its face assumes that the the problem is the employee. So one of the things that I try to think about is that what we really try to do is help the employees really help them help us identify where the problems are. So really, okay. if you look at it, it's it's kind of a matter of of well ultimately i would say it like this if you make it easy for employees to tell you where they're struggling and then allow yeah. them to help solve the struggles then work gets better but i don't yeah. really tell workers what to do at least not anymore now what i do is sort of help workers help me identify what they need yeah, well, that that's a tool. That's that's you, you. You give them a tool and a process. You've given them a voice to. Yeah. So, so um, I don't see I don't see that as a tool in as much as it's it's really allowing. Yeah, maybe it is a tool. I mean, it's it's it, we're arguing semantics here, but but um, yeah. it it allows them the ability to help um, identify problems. I've found that the the biggest the biggest issue is is that generally speaking. We do the problem identification as managers, yeah. And so then we tell the employees what the problem is, and almost always, what we identify as the problem is not really the problem. All right, we get it wrong. Yeah, and and that's a that's a function that's an input problem, not an output problem. So that's a function of bad analysis, or not enough analysis. Uh, and I think generally we just don't do enough analysis. But but I, you know there's lots of lots of new view safety tools. The DOE has a manual that's free on the web that I was a part of the team that put that together, and um, okay. there it's it's called tools, you know. And there, there's tons and tons of stuff they can do. But tools without a problem are kind of masturbatory. So so I don't <laughs> think about I don't think about giving them tools and saying go out and use them. I I, I wait till they they help identify what the problem is. And then, right. then I give tools out as as a part of the solution set. Well, that's that's only logical. You're not going to grab the big wrench until you need it. So right. Although I think a lot of people, a lot, a lot, a lot of people, see it opposite. They they go out and train the tools early because they see that as a way to sort of fix the worker. Um, and yeah. then the workers have gone dutifully through all this training, and there's no place to use the big wrench. But the, and I guess the, the thing I, you're kind of alluding to is that you've instilled a level of confidence in the employees that they feel comfortable coming up and telling you what their problems are and that they're not going to get you know, hammered for for this. I'm, you know, I'm trying to fix something and, and you're going to write me up because I supposedly violated some rule or something, but I'm trying to, I, you know, this thing almost, almost killed me and I'm trying to tell you about it. And uh, I guess, I guess, it seems to me, based on what you're saying, they feel very comfortable 
talking to leadership about what's not right. Yeah, I think the two things you manage are confidence and capacity. So you want to give the workers the confidence to believe they have input and the input will be listened and matters and then the capacity to actually go out into the field and do work in highly variable systems. It's interesting, the example you gave I think is a really good one, but it's almost never that the thing almost killed me. It's that the thing wouldn't let me produce. So they're al- they almost always are going to take actions, adaptive actions, not based upon their own personal safety, although that happens, no doubt about it. But they have way more opportunity yeah. to take adaptive actions because the machine won't make cups or the okay. the drill won't drill. So, so yeah. they almost always cheat towards risk in order to gain towards production. Right. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. They're, that's, they're, they're, that's their job. That's what they've been... That's what they're being paid to do is produce X number of whatever. And uh, Okay. Um, okay, so uh, when I was putting these questions together, um, David Boris helped me put these together. I don't know if you know him. He was my, one of my professors. And, uh, of course, the big thing with Eric's, uh, the premise with Eric's is the work is imagined and work is done. And, um how do you how do you measure and attempt to close that gap between work is imagined and work is done? I think the gap between work is imagined and work is done is normal. So I think that that gap always exists. I'm not sure you want to measure it because it's really variable, and I'm not sure you want to close it because workers need to be adaptive. Workers complete the design. That's really that's paramount and sort of your research is that workers always complete the procedure, workers always complete the instructions, workers always complete the sure. rule. Really the sure. gap that I'm more concerned about is not the gap between the work is imagined and the work is done. The gap that I'm really concerned about is the gap between the work is imagined and the and the hazards that are exposed. So that's okay. the gap that All workers right. manage in real time. So I would add a third line. I actually do add a third line. This is very interesting because everybody had this idea at about the same time. And so (laughs) um, we all have a little bit different approach to it. I use kind of a blue line, black line, red line. Decker talks about drift and accumulation. And Hallnagel talks about sort of this work is imagined versus work is done. Um, It's pretty organic because we're all looking for ways to really talk about the fact that the classic Taylor view of the scientific approach to work management, you know, make a good procedure, Mm -hmm. follow the procedure, don't think. That's really yeah. uh, sexy on the surface, but not terribly practical in reality. So everybody's trying to sort of capture this notion of work always looks different because plans can't plan for unexpected events. I've really yeah. come to the belief that the gap between the work is imagined and the work is done is interesting. And there's a place, I think, to gather improvement. And sometimes you have to raise one line and lower the other line. But I'm not sure that gap is anything other than normal and okay. always present. And so it's it's not it's not terribly important to me. It does become important when you look at the work is done and the actual hazards that are exposed. Yeah, no, no, I I I, I, I totally agree. The the only thing that kind of popped in my mind when I was, was doing this was the you know, the person that's deciding how many how much staffing do you get? How much resources do you get? How much equipment do you get? And uh, um, if the worker is struggling and you don't know that, um, then you're not gonna you're not gonna give them the tools to to do what they need to do. So, that, so that's the only other con. So what you're really saying is that the management team needs to be much more cognizant of the work is done, and that's that's the point yes. I would make as well. It doesn't it doesn't matter yeah. what was planned to happen or what's supposed to happen. What matters is what's happening. Right. And that changes everything. That changes how you do investigations. That changes how you do audits. Because generally speaking, we want to audit and investigate towards work as imagined, towards the counterfactual. Worker failed to, manager failed to. Right. 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 And when you audit towards the work as imagined, then you're actually auditing sort of a fantasy. You're auditing what you wish you had, not what you actually have. (laughs) That's that's right. Yeah, it's funny a little bit when you think about it that you're right. So, 
Oh, all it's right. all um, it's all pretty funny. I grant you, it's hilarious. It's it's it's, it's, it's goofy. <laughs> I think it's goofy yeah. that you, you you can go out and tell people, you know, you should talk to your workers more. That just seems dumb to me. I mean, why aren't they talking to their workers now? It's an incredible resource that's out there, and yet I. You know, I go out and say, talk to your workers, see how work is really done. And they look at me like, oh, my God, you're a genius. You talk. Yeah. Or, you know, well, I, I got some of the opposite thing, you know, actually I have to talk to these people, you know, and, um, and you know, I, I worked in a plant full of engineers. A lot of them were introverts sometimes as they sometimes can be. But uh, it was, uh, you know, someone would just. Some of them would, were fine with it. A lot of them would just look at me in horror, you know, as I actually got to, I got to communicate with these people. And I was like, yeah, you, yeah, you do. And, uh, we, uh, we had a lot of success with, uh, doing plant manager and her staff would do, would do gimbal walks. I don't know if you ever heard that term. Yeah. Before. No, I, you know, kind of goes, I, I think that's where lean and, and safety too kind of, believe it or not, sort of come together. Because yeah. the, when you go out and, and do the gimbal walk, when you go out and actually understand how work is done, it's very, yeah. very, very illuminating. Well, what, two things happen. One is is um, that suddenly leaders see work more as art and less as science. And yeah. it, it really does give dignity to the workers doing the work. And then the second thing is that they almost always come back and say, holy crap, how do we not right. get hurt every day? Right. Yeah. And, and, and the thing, uh, you know, we, we, we had a very methodical way to do it. The, the, the individual would go out by themselves. They would not have someone accompany them with a clipboard to take notes. They went out by themselves. They would engage the worker one-on-one, you know, cause this person's already intimidated. Oh, the plant manager wants to talk to me and, uh, uh to try to make it as, uh, comfortable as possible. And then, um, you know, and, and, and anything was on the table, and you know, not just you know safety. And uh, it was, you know, when I was talking to Tom McDaniel Monday, he kind of reiterated that it's, it's not just the safety. It's uh, you know, I didn't get my paycheck last week, you know, or you know, the insurance screwed up my whatever, you know. And so any of these things that you can can help with um, help. So anyway, I just I was uh, well. You're you're on to something though. I mean, what you're saying is. The gap between safety as a discrete outcome is going away. Is that, in fact, quite honestly, safety and operations are not separate. They're very <laughs> together. And Eric talks about that in in the idea of the efficiency thoroughness trade off in ETTO. Um, right. He talks about that a lot. That book's a little. It, it's it's a little. It'd be a really good paper that he stretched out to a book. So it's a little repetitive, but, <laughs> but I think it's, yeah. I think it really does a nice job in talking about the fact that, th- that what workers are constantly doing is trading off one for the other, but they're not separate. They're, you know, the example I use all the time is if you drive home in a rainstorm, it's definitely going to take you longer because you're mm-hmm. going to trade off efficiency. You're going to go slower in order to gain control, in order to get thoroughness. And so, you know, last night I drove home from the airport. It was raining like crazy, which is kind of unusual in New Mexico, so everyone's sort of freaking <laughs> out. I had to go slower, but what I gained is, it, at least in my opinion, I gained control. I gained some additional recoverability. Where I used to go 80 miles an hour, uh, I was going closer to 40 and 50 miles an hour, which hurt my efficiency but dramatically increase my operator de- reliability. Yeah, and also you were still breathing when you got to where you were going. So. Yep, and I lived through it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. When I talked to Ivan yesterday, he was mentioning it was raining in there, and I, I just, I just sort of, I've, I've never been to New Mexico, but you know, I guess, that, I guess that uh, doesn't happen all the time. As I wish here, we can. I'd, I'd love to give you some of the rain we've been getting. So. Um, <laughs> uh, Okay, so question number seven. This um, be interested in your answer on this. So, what tools? Um, okay, so I asked what tools do you use to implement safety. To how do you perform risk analysis? And so, so that, that question also has has an assumption in it that, and all questions have assumptions. So, so that's sure. part of the research you're doing, right? 
So yeah. the thing about risk analysis is you have to think about not how we perform risk analysis, but can we perform risk analysis and why do we perform risk analysis? So we generally perform risk analysis to manage resource. Okay. Um, it, it doesn't really help us manage risk. It just helps us manage resource around that risk. But the assumption that that question makes is that risk is somehow permanent. The challenge we have is that risk is incredibly fluid. It ebbs and flows. And so any risk analysis I do on Tuesday is probably not going to be valid on Wednesday. And yet, I have to work again on Wednesday, and so I don't have time to only do risk analysis. That really leads us to a better question, which is the notion of how risk competent are the people who actually perform the work. So instead of actually focusing on risk analysis, and let me say, I, I think we need to do risk analysis, and it's important. If we can remove risk from a system, that's always best. The problem is, is yeah. that it's really hard to remove risk, and we can't ever identify all risks. And it also gets to a point that we tend to use the word hazard and risk sort of synonymously, and they're not synonyms. They're really different. The hazard is the thing that can hurt the person, the risk is the person's association to that hazard. And so one of the okay. things that I've become really fixated on is not managing risk by probability, but actually managing risk by certainty. So instead of asking okay. what's risky, I tend to ask what's least recoverable. So if it's a high okay. risk operations, but it's easily recovered, it's not that risky. Because I can recover. I can always have a second chance at the at the bat, right? But if it's a high-risk okay. operation that's not very recoverable, then I want to actually manage that not based upon risk, but actually because we, we're really good at prevention, but we suck at prediction. So I don't do risk right. analysis based upon a percentage. I just assume there's a 100% chance that risk will happen, that the hazard oh, will be okay. interfaced. And then I back away and say... When it happens, what's our resilience? What's our recoverability? Okay. Well, let me ask this. Uh, there's a second part of the question, and um, you know, I may know the answer, but anyway, I'll ask it anyway. So, if, do you have you ever, you know, so you know, Eric's just got a new book out on on resilience engineering, and, and also he has a book out on FRAM. Have you ever used FRAM? Have you ever used the Resilience Assessment Grid or Appreciative Analysis Query in any, as a, as a yes. risk assessment tool? So, okay. yeah, I've, right. so I've been using the Appreciative Suite for a really, really long time. But remember, I'm a social scientist. Okay. So I've been okay. using Cooper Rider's success-based stuff for years and years. I mean, years and years. And I worked with engineers and scientists. And I actually find that the appreciative analysis, appreciative discovery, really works well with technical populations. Technical people really dig it. And, and you wouldn't think okay. they would, but they do. Yeah. The Fram, okay. I worked with a guy named Roger Cruz for years, incredible engineer, incredibly, incredibly, incredibly good uh, safety two guy. He used yeah. Fram, but Fram is really, really complex and really, yeah. really difficult. It's like learning a language almost. And it's very, very, very detail driven. And it's not fast and it's not very efficient. But I think it's pretty thorough, but it's still pretty strongly biased. To me, yeah. I think the key is the space somewhere between safety two and resilience engineering. And so, like, David Woods is really interesting to me because he sort of doesn't fall full-blown 100% engineer fram, you know, draw these little shapes and then squiggly lines between them. But he also isn't entirely soft side like me. He's somewhere in between there. To me, I think what's important is the realization that what we're all trying to desperately do is understand the context, both psychological and physical, that exists really in the process of having an event. So yeah. we look at it sort of not like not like we we keep we keep people safe. What we're really starting to look at it is is that what we do is intervene against failure. That failure is a logical right. outcome because of entropy 
and that because failure is a logical outcome, what we're constantly doing is working hard to try to stop failure from happening. Right. No, I, no, I totally agree. I, the facility I worked at was a PSM site, and um, I had this uh, you know, lady that I brought in to do the, you know, to do the process hazard analysis. And we we would usually do HAZOPS as the as the tool, just to kind of that we're constantly because our systems are constantly going through changes. So this plant I worked at made optical fiber, and so the process is constantly evolving. The product is constantly evolving. Uh, it's getting better, more efficient, more bandwidth, whatever. And so you're constantly bolting on new things to this uh, equipment. Um, and consequently, the, the nodes, everything else about it would change. And we and we walked away from it feeling a lot better because we had like all this stuff that, you know, that was redlined that needed to be fixed. And, uh, um, and we felt more comfortable um, but I don't know. That was just. But but it was all from the equipment side. I don't think it was so much from um, the people operating. And although you know you, you have all these locks and interfaces and everything else you do to to keep them safe because they're in the midst of this stuff. But uh, um, I've often wondered, you know, especially since I've been studying this stuff, just the you know linearity of it, how much it was it was it was doing. I'm, I was, it's good. I'm sure it's great. I'm sure it's, it's prevented us. You know, the, the plants out there. I live three miles from it still. Um, I don't see a green cloud coming out of it. So, you know, we must have done something right, you know. So. Well, sy- anyway. systems systems are mostly stable, too. And people are really, really good at adaptively detecting and correcting in real time. And it's just hard to That's make true. an engineering diagram of, of uh, you know, how, what's that line look like? And, yeah. then, <laughs> and then a guy catches it, right? And so right. that's that's part of the challenge. That, but it's a, yeah, I, it's an interesting way to think. I mean, and it's it's definitely a nod towards linearity. But I don't know. Everybody's still trying to crack the code on how to best understand events. Yeah, I and we're not I done. Even... I mean, there's there's going to be lots more to it. No, it, I think it's I think it's just a combination of everything. You got to do this, but then you got to have that. Anyway, we could we could talk for hours about that, and I know you don't have that much time. Um, so we're we're down to like three questions left, um, three or four questions. Question number eight is how do you measure safety success? And, and, and so so let me stop you there. The, okay. the better the better question is how do you define safety success? So okay. it it depends. If you see safety as an outcome to be achieved, then you measure it retrospectively. It's it's a product. Yeah. If you see safety yeah. as a capacity, then you have to look at it differently. Ultimately, how the organization defines safety is going to color how they, they measure safety. If if they see it as an outcome, then they're going to look at things like total reportable cases and days away. Those are really right. horrible metrics. They're, they're not yes, very they informative, are. but they're really powerful, but they suck. Yeah. If they see it yeah. as a capacity, then they're really going to become much more interested in this question. How do you see and understand normal work? So instead of understanding safety, what you understand is what's my capacity to do high-risk work in a variable system and what's my resilience? So what's my recoverability? When this fails, what engages? And you want to really probably start looking at safety on a maturity curve. So uh, you want to measure vectors, not numbers. Because remember, complex systems never can be measured in any single point in time. So you always compl- you measure complexity by measuring direction, not by measuring discrete moments, because it's complex, right? And so you really want to ask the question, are we getting better? Are we getting worse? Are we staying the same? So are we vectoring towards improvement, or are we vectoring away from improvement towards blame and punishment? And that's really how I look at it. The best document okay. to look at for that is a document from IAEA, and the number is called Tech Doc, T-E-C-D-O-C, 1329. And it really talks about seeing safety and safety culture and safety performance, not as an outcome, but as a capacity. Yeah, we, we, we were trying to use all kinds of proactive measures, but the problem was it was their, the management and leadership was all fixated on lost time accident and recordability. 
And uh, yep. so no matter what you've done, you know, if you had a recordable for whatever reason, you know, guy slipped in the parking lot before he got in his car, you know, um, you know broke his ankle. And, uh, you know, just because of, for whatever reason, not for anything hazard you had, well, that, that went on your 300 log and now you were dirt. So, <laughs> And that scares me because, uh, because that we give, we give an ankle sprain the same importance as a chemical explosion. And, yeah. and that's, um, that's just not the case. And everybody knows it's not the case, but we don't know what to measure. I'll, I'll tell you something bold. There is no such thing as a leading safety metric. You know how come yeah. I can say that? Because we don't have Why any. Is that? If there were okay. leading metrics, BP would have paid for them, and we'd all be using them yeah. right now. <laughs> that's true. That's true. I mean, we we would pick things like the number of safety observations we had found and closed. But as soon as you make that a, a leading metric, it becomes lagging. As soon as you say we need to have 14 of those, then on the last day of the month, somebody's out there doing 11 of them to get us up to the 14. So right, yeah. it's the, metrics are really hard. And I think they're hard because what when we look at metrics, what we're trying to say is that reliable performance is an outcome to be achieved. It's not an outcome; it's a capacity. You manage it in real time. It's it's not it's not like taking a trip. When you take a trip, when you get there, you're done. But you'll never right. be done with reliability and safety. Not in high risk operations. It's it's you're never done. Okay, number nine. And when do you feel the need to refresh safety in your organization? Well, again, that that assumes safety as an outcome that you'll be done. Um, you you it's a capacity you're never not refreshing safety you're you're always okay. managing safety in real time so that's okay. an easy question to answer yeah that's that's and that's 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 what your buddy ivan said yesterday he says continuous process it never stops so. um all right this is uh yeah i haven't really liked this question because he tells me he's getting ready to retire <laughs> Uh, what would you recommend for someone coming behind you? In other words, what would you do differently if you were just starting out? So read more. Um, there's lots of great stuff out there, and there's only going to become more and more good stuff. Look at and read and think. The most important thing I think that I'd recommend is to consciously focus on the fact that how we see the workers – colors how we manage this program and so listen okay. for things like victim language and you know they are bad and kind of move okay. people beyond that but ultimately i think the next great safety leaders that are going to exist in our world aren't thinking about safety they're running things like devops or artificial intelligence or driverless cars they're they're not they're not going to be safety people. They're going to be people that understand systems and understand complexity. And and really, that's the direction I think probably our thinking is going to go. And that's that's kind of a fine place for it to go. That's pretty cool. No, it, you're right. I, I, I agree. You know, this, I mean, because all that keeping us alive in the process has to be incorporated into all of that. And thus ends the interview. I mean, there was a bunch of uh, thanks for talking to me and all that kind of stuff at the end. But <clears throat> pretty much that is where we stopped with the content. And I thought it was worth putting on the pod just because, well, why not? It's content. And I thought it was relatively interesting. And I really wanted you to hear it and sort of see what you thought. How'd I do? Did I do okay? I mean, I, it's, you know, I, I tried to answer the questions as best I could. That's what I tried for. Thanks for being a part of the podcast. Tell your friends, for goodness sakes, you guys, uh, if you get a chance, um, subscribe and have everyone else in your company subscribe. That'd be great. <laughs> Until then, my friends, I hope you get what you need. Have as much fun as you possibly can. Learn something new every single day. And for goodness sakes, be safe. Ron Gant's dead.
thinks this music sounds like porno music. Do you agree? I, I'm at, you know, I don't, I've never seen a porno, but if I would, do you think so?